Pablo Schreiber joins me in Studio Q. Thanks for coming in. Oh, man, what a pleasure. So I saw the film last night. Congratulations. Thank you. You play, tell people who haven't seen it yet, uh, you play Chris Tonto Peronto, a CIA contractor. Tell us a bit about him. Yeah, Chris uh, Chris is a very large personality. He uh, he has a big sense of humor. So uh, I think one of the one of the key things about him and and in this movie is that he uh, when things get crazy and when the bullets start to fly, he he cuts tension by by um, cracking jokes and trying to keep everybody around him loose. So um, uh, that's the thing that uh, in meeting him was very important to learn was uh, his particular brand of humor. Well, and that's the thing. I mean, you're playing somebody who's still alive. You're playing a very real character from a very recent place, piece mm-hmm. of history. There was a bit of a media storm uh, around the Benghazi attacks and how the U.S. government handled that situation in 2012. So much so that the director of the film, Michael Bay, says that his mother advised him not to do this movie <laughs> because it was too controversial. Uh, tell me, why? what did you think about that and why did you agree to take part? Well, the good news is Michael Bay's mom has now seen the movie and she now agrees that he should have taken the movie because it is uh, it, it is a much less controversial movie than I think a lot of people expect it to be. Uh, we're telling a true story about these guys and, and the events on the ground that evening. Everybody knows the political talking points about Benghazi. Everybody's heard the term Benghazi, but I don't think I don't think very many people know about the facts of what happened and what happened to these guys. And that's the only thing we're focusing on is telling these guys' story and what happened to them. And, uh, you know, politics don't really come into play here. Yeah, it it seems that the choice has been very clearly made to avoid Mm -hmm. any political... I mean, the story stays the entire time in that location. There's really no sense of what was happening elsewhere, what was the U.S. political reaction or otherwise. So that was a conscious decision. Was that part of why you agreed? You thought they were sidestepping any controversy that way? Um, I'm not sure if it's sidestepping. Stepping, I think it's just dealing with the facts of the matter. The, this comes from a book that was written by Mitchell Zuckoff. He's a, a, an award-winning journalist for the Boston Globe, the New York Times, and he wrote a very in-depth and thorough account of, of these guys' story. You know, and um, and Michael, to his credit, took that that template of of a well-researched book and put it on the screen. So at the end of the day, uh, all, all that we're telling is is these guys' actions and their perspective on that evening. You know, they they felt um, they felt that they were left behind, and and who left them behind is not for us to say. It's uh, it's just um, dealing with the facts of the matter on the day. So what's that like, the responsibility of playing somebody who, as you say, you've met? I mean, you're portraying a character um, who is real uh, about in a story that, that was very real. The consequences meant so much to the people that you were trying to represent. What was that responsibility like? It is. It's a, it's a big responsibility, you know. Uh, it, it, at first, just to get the facts of the story right was a huge responsibility. I think Michael took that one very seriously. And we as actors took that seriously in, in meeting the people that we were portraying. And then the responsibility of playing somebody that uh, at the end of the day is going to see this movie and is going to see themselves portrayed on screen. And you're telling a story where people lost their lives, not just the four Americans that lost their lives, but hundreds of Libyans, you know. And at the end of the day, uh, I think that's one of the things for me that that resonates with this movie is that uh, at the end of the day, there are no winners in this movie. Everybody goes home a loser, you know. Um, War is not an easily summed up uh, thing and it's not a happy event. You know, this was a, this was an unfortunate event in in not only American history but in the history of the region, and so um, I think it's just something that we can look at, learn from, and hopefully not repeat our mistakes. Having portrayed the facts, as you say, you know that was what you stuck to was telling those people's story. Benghazi is still a hot button issue in the U.S. in an election year. Megyn Kelly of Fox News has suggested that this film would be damaging to Hillary Clinton's campaign. What do you make of the political conversation swirling around a film in spite of having tried to uh, or in spite of having avoided the political aspects of it? There's sure. still that conversation swirling around it. Yeah, I just I just don't think that uh, it, it's it's above my pay grade to worry about politics and, and what people are going to make out of this and who's going to use it for their agenda. Um, I, I don't believe that, uh, that that's within the realm of my, of my need to worry about it. You know, it's, uh, it's a, but uh, to be part of something that some people argue would have an, mm -hmm. will have an impact, could potentially have an impact on the outcome of the U S federal election. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would be, that would be a huge thing to be a part of. Uh, at the end of the day, the thing that I'm focusing on is that I'm a part of a story that, uh, that is bringing these guys story to light. And um, I, for me, it's a it's a hugely inspiring story. It's a story about heroism. It's a story about um, real people behaving um, incredibly well under very difficult circumstances. And that's what I'm focusing on. 
I can tell. <laughs> you don't want to talk about that. I also wonder, too, about what it's like for you. You grew up in Canada. You mm-hmm. spent the first 12 years of your life here. Yeah. Now you're immersed in a story that sort of has implications one way or the other about American politics. Does that sit? Do you still feel Canadian? For sure, yeah. I mean, I grew up in BC uh, until I was 12. I moved to Seattle when I was 12. Uh, and spent uh, the rest of my my time in the states. But of course, I, I grew up in rural BC. And you were born on a commune, as I understand. Well, that is true. That is true. I moved off of it when I was six months old. So, okay, so no uh, stories to yeah, recount no, there. No, not a lot of formative years were spent there. But um, but still, you know, I I still feel like I'm from BC for sure. You do. What traits do you feel that you carry <clears throat> around with you in your American movie star life that that are Canadian? Uh, the biggest one would be a, a real love of nature. You know, I grew up uh, on a on a 12 acre property. My nearest neighbor was a mile away. Uh, I like to say all my best friends were trees, and uh, and you know I carry that with me wherever I go. I heard that you take your kids camping. You go on epic road trips with uh, with pop up campers for for your little kids. And so all, you're a- all true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We get out as much as we can. We just went to Mammoth uh, for, for skiing for New Year's, which was a lot of fun. So let's talk about how you got started. You from those early days and with <laughs> hanging out with the trees in mm-hmm. Canada. How you got into acting? Your dad, Tell Schreiber, was an actor and an acting teacher. Mm-hmm. And your older half brother, Liev Schreiber, is of course a famous actor in his own right. And yet you've said that acting, in spite of that, wasn't necessarily the obvious choice for you. You actually tried to reject the path. Yeah, I was six foot one in ninth grade and uh, about 145 pounds, so I thought I should be a basketball player. So I tried to do that. I pursued bas- basketball for a little while, and when I went to university and that didn't work out, uh, the only other fallback plan I had was uh, was to try to be an actor. So I auditioned for acting school, went to Carnegie Mellon for four years, and uh, the rest is history. Wait, tell me about that moment. What you mean a fallback plan? What was? What was? <laughs> what was there must have been a moment when you decided, you know what, I, I do like this. Well, all through high school, they were competing interests. You know, I, I started in the plays. Uh, I played Tevia and Fiddler on the Roof. You know, if I was a rich man, had a little fat pad and a fake beard. Um, Let's hear you sing. If I were a rich man, ba da ba da ba da dee 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 dum little 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 little. Okay, yeah, nice. That kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Still got the recall. Yeah. Oh yeah. Um, okay. So so what? It was literally a high school moment that where the bug could have bit you a bit. Yeah, for sure. And well, also, you know, when I was a child watching my father, uh, he started a program in, in, in BC at uh, David Thompson University, uh, which then uh, was shut down. But, um, but watching him uh, teach acting to, to his students and, and for that to be a thing that, uh, you know, I think for Lee and I, it's, uh, it has opposite trajectories. I grew up with my father and he was around. And so I watched him deal with it. He grew up in New York away from my father. And so for him, there was like the mysterious dad that, that was an acting teacher that wasn't there. And I think that was a draw for him. So I'm not sure exactly. Uh, we could psychoanalyze it for a long time, but uh, but we both That's ended up in the same. For. We both ended up in the same <laughs> career, regardless. Right. <laughs> well, I want to talk uh, a little bit about the people, the role, mm. I should say, that uh, perhaps most people know you for. George Pornstash Mendez, one of the more polarizing characters <clears throat> on the popular Netflix. Netflix series Orange Is the New Black. So Pornstash has emerged as kind of a fan favorite on Orange is the New Black, even though he's super creepy. What is uh, what is it that people find compelling about him, do you think? Uh, good writing would be the number one answer. Uh, Genji Cohen, obviously, is the showrunner on, on Orange is the New Black, and, and I think she's one of the greatest writers in the business. And one of the things that she does that I think is so incredibly smart is uh, she undercuts your expectations. So in in the first season, he was, he was the villain, and he was just awful, and it, she spent the entire season building up this, this art archetype that then she completely cut down at the end of the season when uh, when she had him fall in love with Daya you know and you and you saw how how sort of sweet and over the moon he could be uh, and and I think that you know she does it with every single character you know crazy eyes of course she did you know seeing her upbringing in in rural Connecticut and uh, so to to pull the rug out from under under your feet when you're just thinking you start to know who a character is, she completely uh, 180 and reverses you. So uh, I think that's the main reason that people have connected to him is that, um, is that you know, he changed expectations of, of where he thought it was going. Um, and then, you know, the other, the other aspect I think is, for me, I'm very attuned to um, finding, finding out what makes a character tick uh, through their insecurities, you know, finding out what each character's specific insecurity is and how it makes them behave. And, and I believe when you tap into that, um, all forms of hideous behavior can be 
uh, seen through a new lens. What did you bring? Because I gather that you were given a lot of leeway to explore those ticks and to Mm. make this character your own. What did you bring? Give me some examples of things that you personally brought to the character written for you. Oh, I mean, just tons of, uh, you know, a a ton of that character is improv. And, uh, you know, she allowed me to to create kind of willy nilly. I mean, just specific examples. Uh, There's a there's a line. uh, um, Well, can we can we say unsavory things on the air? Uh, I guess it depends on how unsavory. <laughs> there's a, there's a line the... that's very reminiscent of Dr. Seuss, and it's this blank, that blank, blank. Anyway, uh, yeah, sorry. Okay, that's a terrible example because we'll I can't it. say it on the radio. Uh, <laughs> uh, anyhow, just a, a, lot of, a lot of the great lines and things that came out were things that, uh, that were taken from the blueprint of the character she had created, but I was, I was allowed to basically – I had free reign to be as hideous as possible. Basically, any situation that I was in, I, I was allowed to take it to the extreme. And when you have that freedom with the character, I think it can just be a lot of fun. What, what about the mustache? The styling's there. That's It was um, itchy. That's enhanced, is it not, that mustache? <laughs> it's more than enhanced. It's entirely created. You're sporting a, a, a fine mustache right now. Well, thank you for saying that's that. That's not I, it's, enhanced. No, no, it's certain. And it's no porn stash, let's be no. honest. No, <laughs> okay. it's more of like a, a strong duster. <laughs> um no, I, it, that was a that was a glue on. I, I don't I don't grow that kind. Of, I, I think of myself as a little more follicularly challenged than he is on the upper lip. So, I need help in that department. What is the secret? I always wonder about the effect of a prop like that, or mm-hmm. a, you know, a, whether it's a pair of glasses or a or a, a mustache or whatever, it, and how that sort of takes you and puts you into a character. What's the secret of, of playing porn stash for you? Well, it's interesting that you, that you uh, touch on that because I, I, I'm not normally an outside-in actor. I, I tend to, to work, uh, try to figure out what makes a character tick, look at their, uh, you know, psychoanalyze their behavior, et cetera, et cetera, and then kind of figure out through that how the character looks. But this was completely the opposite. This was very much like... We went in for – actually, just in the way that I got the role was that way because Genji offered me the part without an audition but but said, come in because we want to try some mustaches on you to make sure that's going to work, right? So we had a mustache fitting. So we went through about three or four different mustaches, and finally we found the one that she thought was perfect. And, um, and that's really when it all began was – and even more than the mustache for me was the haircut in the first season. I came in with a picture of Dolph Lundgren from Rocky IV, and and I said, "This is this is the guy. You have to give me this haircut." So the the high and tight, the flat top, uh, combined with the just hideous uh, porn stash. As soon as I had that uh, combination together, it just came alive. I don't know. Like I went on set the first day, and the first scene we shot was the. Um, in the first season, he's doing a, an example of all the dangerous weapons that can be used uh, to harm. In and it was you know kind of like a two or three sentence line, uh, and and it just turned into this like three page monologue where the the crew was just dying laughing, and it became obvious that there was something there with the look of the character right. and the way he behaved, you know. And I think there's something again going back to like insecurity. I think there's something about. A guy, and this is a this is an archetype character that's been very popular. You know, Will Ferrell does it, Danny McBride does it. Um, the the guy who thinks he's incredibly amazing, who has no right to believe that. You know, and I think it's just a really ripe and fun archetype. It must be as an actor, it must be so satisfying to really nail. I mean, what you describe, you know, you're given two lines, and boom, yeah. out comes the monologue, and everyone's loving it. And that's you know through the whole run of the show and this character you know that audiences are loving. Even if we love to hate for sure, stash, sure, yeah, you're, yeah. Really, you're really nailing it. Um, I would imagine that's an incredible feeling. And yet, do you ever wonder or worry about being so good at that kind of character that people only see porn stash when you're playing other characters? Uh, I've never worried about it. People have asked that question a lot. You know, uh, are you worried about getting typecast as the bad guy or whatever? And the whole time, because that character came out the same time as a, a villain I did from Law & Order SVU, who was like this hideous rapist, and they came out at the exact same time. And and I, uh, people were asking me if I was worried about that, and I'm not, you know. 
Uh, and, well, and, and in I fairness, think the proof, your the, character in uh, Tonto. That's in, what I was about to say. The proof now is in the pudding, and you know th- that. In thirteen hours. Char- thank you uh, for getting that in. That character is is uh, is not an evil guy, and uh, and that's that's popping out of this movie too. So he, you know, I don't know. It, I feel very fortunate as an actor that um, that some of the work that I've done has been uh, appreciated, and that people audiences latch on to it. And and obviously, you know, I've been doing it for fifteen years, and uh, to to varying degrees of success, and to have those moments where people respond to what you do is a very humbling and and uh, and I feel gr- very grateful for it. I know you've been nominated for a Tony Award for mm. your work in theater, which always adds so much cred, I, fi- I think, to uh, to an actor's resume. Never just the theater work, never mind the Tony Award. I got it, you know, we're talking on the day of the Oscar sure. uh, nominations. Do you fantasize? Is that what actors do? Do you dream of that, the day when you hear your name announced? Uh, you know, I, I think you're lost if you start focusing on on looking for uh, that kind of reward from your work. The, the the biggest reward that I think you can look for in your work is that is that your part of the story is told complete. You know, as an actor, we only have control over our small portion of a story. And we're all here to fulfill the, the writer and the director's vision, you know. And at the end of the day, if you can watch a movie and and feel like what you decided your job was has then been fulfilled, that's ultimately the, the real reward is to, is to be a part of telling a story that can be somehow uh, affecting for people. And so I take it project by project um, in terms of looking for whether or not I'm, I'm doing my job and telling the story correctly. Do you feel like you did that when you look at 13 hours? I do, yeah. I, I'm actually very proud of this movie. And, and, and as I repeated earlier, I think it's a lot less controversial than, than people think. Um, I'm very proud of Michael. I think it's a, an evolution in his uh, filmmaking. I think it's a much deeper story than he's told before. I think he builds character and relationship in a way that he hasn't done in a movie yet. So I'm proud of him for that, and I'm, and I'm proud to be a part of the movie. It's, it's true. It's certainly not your, av- not your typical Michael Bay film, yeah. and uh, I enjoyed it. Thank you. I enjoyed this conversation. Thanks, Thanks for Jill. being nice here. Nice to talk to you.